Welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind, a competitive slash cooperative, maybe in the future, series between Beardy, Penguin, and myself in the Cold War era using realism overhaul and all that. Last we left off, we were right on the edge of Flying Gemini, a two-crew spacecraft, and we are way behind the Soviets in crewed spaceflight. So, before we start, it turns out the Soviets were in fact making a lander, and they did land on the moon at the same exact day as Mayflower did, but we beat them by something like six hours. Discoverer 4 has experienced sort of an anomaly that coincides with a Soviet launch that launched to the same inclination, and we can't prove anything but it's safe to assume our Discoverer satellites are compromised. And if something happened, well, it will be cancelled and replaced with something much cooler. But more on that in the future. March 1st, 1962. Wallop's launch facility has seen a major upgrade to its infrastructure, allowing for the use of medium-class launch vehicles rather than being limited to scouts and sounding rockets. They should see the use of the Catalyst missile in the future, but for now, all Pathfinder launches are to be directed from this location, the first of which is launching now. The mission will be a small Cairo satellite with weather-sensitive instruments to be the first of its kind launched by the Foundation. Pathfinder has gotten a noticeable upgrade from past iterations, most noticeably in its livery. However, the upper stage is brand new and sports unlimited ignitions should nothing go wrong. It is called the Cable Star Upper Stage. Much more capable than the Cable Stage it replaces. Shutting down its engines, Kairos-1 is in orbit of the Earth, but the orbit isn't quite right. The apogee much too high and the perigee just barely too low for contract requirements. No matter, a simple 50 meters per second burn several minutes later over ground stations in Africa will do just fine to fix both orbital parameters. This is where the upper stage's ignitions strut their stuff with ease. Kairos-1 is now free to detach and deploy its various sensors. No mechanical science experiment is actually on board, so this is more of a demonstration for technology but serves the contract requirements well, and the Foundation gets a small chunk of change for it, alongside demonstrating the Wallops team is capable of launching such missions. Within the first few months of 1962, we passively gained a lot of science, and that's going to go to unlocking our fuel cell for Gemini right away. And I have 43 science, that is enough to grab improved flight control, which is on its way to early docking procedures. However, I'm actually going to save this science for lunar rated heat shields, because I think that this will uh, play an important part sooner than these. Although, honestly, with the Gemini flight hopefully succeeding, we should have enough science to grab all of this stuff, and then think about dinosaur, and then think about the A12, because I want these, I want these so bad. Um, yeah, that's where we're at for science. March 26th, 1962. The Mercury program has come to a close. In fact, it decidedly hit a brick wall after Mercury 3's black op. Peter was astute to provide in lengthy detail the spacecraft's shortcomings for any sort of complicated operation. Using what they have learned from these few flights, for the last almost two years now, a new replacement for Mercury, originally developed as Mercury Mark II, has been in development. Today marks its maiden flight as Peter and Eileen both sit aboard the vessel, eagerly awaiting liftoff. During the time it took to research and design this vehicle, the Soviets have flown their multi-crew capsule a handful of times, giving themselves many firsts in the space race, bolstering their ego as well as securing a lot of funds. 
Though we were behind in technology for years, now it is safe to say we're right on their heels. And Gemini One aims to prove this in its entirety. That's right, Gemini, not Kemini, and not Mercury Mark II. I've decided to go with a G rather than a K, as it just didn't sound right that way. But anyways, more about the mission will be explained during flight. For now, Gemini 1 is go for launch, and starts up the Chitin 2's turbo pumps with that sound we all know and love. Eileen and Peter separate their capsule from the Chitin 2 upper stage. They've made it to orbit. Now their mission in the brand new capsule truly begins. Apart from constantly monitoring life support systems, their first objective will be to verify control of the spacecraft. This is provided by 16 or so thrusters called the OMS, or Orbital Attitude and Maneuvering System. This will provide attitude and translational control, though attitude is tested first of all. Eileen ensures attitude thrusters are working properly and orients the vessel to view their first of many sunsets. Gemini has a much better viewing window than Mercury had, as requested by Peter, and when the sun sets during the night times of their flight, the two pilots will study the feasibility and operational value of star occlusion navigation, essentially by measuring the time stars dip behind an established horizon. Coasting through their first night in less than an hour, their next objective will be to test rendezvous capability and translational control authority. This will be accomplished by, via statistics transmitted from ground control, catching back up to the Chitin 2 upper stage, which the crew has verified has purposefully drifted far away and out of sight by this time. A 13 meters per second burn is planned and executed, and just off the west coast of Mexico, they'll burn 13 meters per second in the opposite direction, theoretically coming to a stop right next to the Chitin upper stage. Peter, having conducted orbital rendezvous already, directs the maneuver with ease. Eileen and Peter were able to determine the upper stage was left in a slight end-over-end -end rotation. Arriving at their target, this is once again verified. But they've had over an hour to think about this by now, and it's given the crew an idea how to truly test the ohms, to give it a run for its money, so to speak. The initial idea before launch was to simulate a theoretical idea of reattaching themselves to another spacecraft. Such hardware does not yet exist, but is currently in development. Being able to once again attach to a rocket stage in orbit of the Earth entails endless mission possibilities, including multi-launch missions such as possible orbital outposts, but we're getting ahead of ourselves there. Such ideas are still mostly science fiction at this point, though one of Gemini's primary goals is to bring that fiction closer to reality. For now, we arrive at Eileen and Peter's idea to test the spacecraft's metal. They would like to attempt a simulated tether with the spinning upper stage, essentially placing their craft in front of the other, matching its rotation, and attempting to stay absolutely stationary relative to it all the while. Theoretically, it's possible. Its practicality, however, is probably a bit unstable. They are able to manage this for several rotations before detaching from their simulated tether to observe the spinning upper stage once more. Their conclusion being, the Astro Foundation has built a spacecraft that is beautifully equipped to tether and reattach to another vessel in orbit 
once such hardware and mission profiles are devised. In short, Eileen and Peter are more than pleased with the maneuverability of Gemini. All notions satisfied, the crew depart from their orbital dance lesson and move on to their next objective. After watching the sun rise on their third orbit, it's time for one of the most exciting tasks laid out for the mission, a spacewalk. Not the first in history, as Alexei Kerman of the Soviet space program has already accomplished this feat. However, it is the first performed by the Astral Foundation, and a moment the crew of Gemini 1 have been dreaming about for quite a while. Peter is first up, depressurizing the cabin, opening the hatch, securing his tether, and stepping out into the unforgiving vacuum of space. This experience he would later describe as dangling on the edge of oblivion. Lightly reeling back the tether, Peter makes his way back to the spacecraft, awkwardly and clumsily, I might add. Grabbing onto the hatch once again, the tether makes a sudden jerk before settling, hurling the entire spacecraft into a spin. This was attributed to a wrong button being pressed, which Peter blames on the clunky spacesuit he's wearing. But nevertheless, now it's Eileen's turn to spacewalk. Whereas Peter was tethered to merely four or five meters away, Eileen wants to go further, stepping out of the enclosure of Gemini and into the black, making her way to a relatively astronomical 20 meters from safety. The cities flying past below her seem so far away and yet so close from this perspective. And the Earth feels so big and the spacecraft so, so small in comparison. Such a small vessel to the universe, yet one so immensely important to her survival. Pulling on the tether, she makes her way, just as awkwardly as Peter, back to the Gemini. After the two Kerbonauts have settled, they orient the craft to observe the third sunset of their mission. The first three orbits have been quite eventful. Now Eileen and Peter will spend the next five days completing more mundane tasks in comparison. Photographic observations of zodiacal light and other dim light phenomena, simple navigation without input from ground stations, as well as more star oculation navigation as mentioned previously. Four days into their mission, an alarm begins to blare. CO2 levels are rising to 2%, starting to endanger the crew. Luckily, a simple recycle of the lithium CO2 scrubber brought it back online and working properly, and the mission is able to continue for 24 more hours. And after spending five days in low Earth orbit, despite all of its wonder, Eileen and Peter are more than ready to come back home. The equipment module jettisoned, the retro module had fired, also detached by now. Now all that remains of Gemini is the re-entry module, on course for re-entry to the Gulf of Mexico. Unlike Mercury, Gemini is capable of more than a simple ballistic re-entry. Its center of mass is offset to allow slight control of atmospheric entry based on its roll attitude. 
This has yet to be tested until now, really, and will prove to be the final objective of Gemini 1. Track and speed, Eileen and Peter. May you return back home safe and sound. Well, it appears the Foundation has yet to establish a reliable means of predicting landing locations, to any extent whatsoever. Instead of making it to the Gulf of Mexico, Gemini 1 lands on a beach in Mexico off the coast of the Gulf of California. Recovery is made once again via conversations with the Mexican government. Landing in their country is starting to become an accidental habit of the United States. Though relations still allow for a safe recovery here, so all is well. Eileen and Peter take some much needed time to rest, and the Foundation celebrates the success of a very important mission, and the ambitions for the Gemini program grow tenfold. What we are going to be unlocking is docking here. Early docking procedures will be researched. We'll get docking ports that gives us access to more things. Uh, and next up, next up we are unlocking prototype space planes. We are grabbing the dinosaur because I would like to fly it, and I have an excuse to. So we're gonna grab that node. That's very exciting. Next up, 64 orbital rocketry. We'll have an upgrade to our Chitin missile to make it a little bit more reliable and a tiny bit more powerful. But mostly the reliability is what I'm worried about. So we'll grab that one after that. And then with 36 science points remaining, we'll move down here to 64 to 65 solid rocket engines because that gives us the 1204 and 1205 boosters. Now we won't technically have a Chitin 3 until this node here, but nothing is stopping us from putting these SRBs onto the Chitin 2 to really up its power. I am excited to do that, so we'll grab that. And yeah, that's what we have. Now we still have science passively being trickled down and we have a lot of science in the queue now and we have more missions coming up that should get us even more science so this should be good for now this contract here which keeps changing its parameters mind you before it was about seven eight days that we needed now look at this three days four days we can do this without the fuel cells for gemini so just the batteries we should be able to do this contract perfectly fine we could have done this on the first flight so we're out 400k for that flight but we'll do it on the next one and then lunar landing and sample return isn't really something I think I'm capable of, but it gives us two years to figure it out. So I'm gonna give myself two years to figure it out and give me that advance money. If I have to, I will extend the contract, all right? I think I can extend the contract. Oh God, is it one I can't extend the contract on? Where is it? Where is it? Lunar sample return. Okay, we can decline it. Okay, we're good. <laughs> all right, yeah, we should be good here. Next on the list for things to do with all the money we have is spend a million funds to upgrade our R&D. Look at that, a million are gone. Ah, oh, it's just so quick that our money disappears. That's gonna take 87 days, the exact amount of time, save for an hour and a half, that it's gonna take to unlock our lunar rated heat shields. So after our lunar rated heat shields are unlocked, our speed for R&D will go up another 25%, I think it is. So that'll be nice with unlocking a lot of these. And speaking of these, we are actually going to prioritize things in a different order. And that's gonna involve simply moving our prototype space planes technology in front of docking. So we researched that first, just because I want it quicker than that. We'll see what our times are in 87 days. May 17th, 1962. Communications in orbit of the Earth leave a lot to be desired. With a growing number of active satellites, things are getting better, but not every launch is capable of sending more up, especially into specific orbits that end up being beneficial for any sort of network. Dedicated satellites specifically designed for this task are currently being developed. Their program name is OSCS. OSCS-1 sits atop a Chitin-2 cable star, this somewhat strange looking Chitin Pathfinder love child meant specifically for this mission and likely no other afterwards. 
and it's ready for liftoff. Titan 2's upper stage falls away, and it's Cable Star's turn to push OSC-1 into orbit. Mere seconds before shutting down its engine, Cable Star loses line of sight with ground stations and is unable to shut down. This most likely spells failure for the mission, as precious fuel is being depleted. But luckily, not long after, communications are restored, and the engine is able to shut down. Its orbit is now definitely not ideal due to the extra fuel used, and the Foundation rushes to determine if the mission can be saved. Now's a good time to tell you the specifics of its intended final orbit. The Central Intelligence Agency has uncovered Soviet orbital engineering documents displaying a type of orbit which allows a satellite to hang over northern latitudes of the Earth in an orbit half that of geostationary essentially providing communications over the Soviet Union in a more efficient manner than geostationary. This orbit is called a Molnia orbit, and has interested the United States for the same reasons, though likely not for the same intentions. And so, the US Air Force played a vital part in directing the Foundation towards parameters that fit this goal. The intended orbit will be roughly 64 degrees inclination, an apogee of roughly 40 million meters, perigee of above 500 kilometers, and an argument of periapsis somewhere between 220 and 320 degrees. Thankfully, not enough fuel was wasted to cause the mission to fail, and so Cable Star burns its engine above Antarctica to place OSCS into its intended orbit. The burn is successful. OSCS-1 releases from its ride, unfurls its panels, and gets comfortable. It's going to be here for quite a long time, providing predictable communications in the Northern Hemisphere. Mission success. April 2nd, 1962. A United States Air Force KC-135, specially configured for reconnaissance, is airborne near the Arctic Circle. Its crew would detect an enormous flare emanating from the appearance of a fireball five miles wide, rising over five miles into the sky. Following the display, an enormous mushroom cloud much larger than ever seen before it reaches an altitude of 40 miles. Over the next few days, blast and seismic waves circle the globe several times over. The event would later be concluded as a Soviet demonstration, the most powerful nuclear weapons test ever conducted, an aerial hydrogen bomb called Sarbama. The implications of this clear display of Soviet nuclear potential is met with an uneasiness felt all across the United States, as well as many other countries in the world. Discoverer 4 and 5 are instructed to utilize their camera feed to photograph this event as it happens as they fly ahead in Earth orbit. However, Discoverer 4's instrumentation has been detecting an anomaly for four months now, either due to a faulty sensor or a problem with the device meant to feed film into the return capsule. Foundation decides to allow the satellite to remain in orbit for the time being, despite the uncertainties. Tensions are rising to a boiling point between the two superpowers, though as more advanced and capable ICBMs are devised, it does in turn give the space program more launch vehicles to utilize in the meantime, inspecting and acquiring more Chitin and Catalyst missiles no longer in service by the military. June 9th, 1962. Wallop's launch site sees more action in the first half of the year, 
as a Pathfinder is scheduled to launch an STA, or NAVSAT test article, into a 900 km orbit with an inclination of 66 degrees. This satellite's control will then be handed over from the Foundation to its customer, netting a small sum of funds for the space program. More work like this is intended to be performed here in Wallops, possibly being more lucrative later on. But for now, early in the morning, NSTA is go for launch. Pathfinder D and Cable Star do a phenomenal job in placing NTSA into orbit, despite some unplanned explosions of the small solid motors on board Cable Star. Control is handed over to the customer in its nominal orbital parameters, and the mission is a success. So here we are in the astronaut complex, a building we haven't been in the entire series because we haven't needed to hire any new Kerbinauts yet. But before we do that, I've got some good news and some bad news. And to go over the bad news first, uh, through Beardy and I moving files and configs in our installs over the months that we've been playing this, uh, it's come to my realization that I had four files in the wrong place. Those files concerned the different tech tree changes we were making, but apparently it also affects our build speeds. And until I moved them into the correct place, which was a few days ago, like halfway through this episode, I moved those files into the correct place because that's when I realized they were wrong. Before then, our build speeds were 59% of what they are now. And I've verified with Beardy, the build speeds that are faster now are what they should be. So we've been at 59% speed from when we updated to 110, we've been slower than what we should be, basically. But canonically, this is okay to me, even though we have been at an extreme disadvantage because of this, because this is when John F. Kerman would be proposing lunar landings to the Senate. It's before the Rice speech. That happens later on in the year. Uh, but this is when interest in the space program is really at an all-time high. It's, it's rising very quickly, especially with the Cold War things we're doing, like Beardy visiting uh, possibly a satellite. We haven't confirmed that yet either. Uh, but just the stuff that's going on, it would make sense that right now we would get a major boost. But yeah, that was the bad news there. Uh, the good news is that Gemini 2 is ready to roll out to the pad, and we have to hire two new Kerbinauts. The first being an engineer, the second being a pilot. And first and foremost, we are choosing Michael Collins Kerman as a new pilot. They will retire no earlier than 1970. Nice, nice. And then we are choosing Neil Armstrong Kerman as our engineer. Now, the reason that I have Neil being an engineer instead of a pilot uh, is because, well, I mean, they could go, he could go either way, but we need an engineer. And if we bring Neil Armstrong to the moon, to the lunar surface, I think I'd rather them be an engineer just in case we need to do engineer things that only an engineer can in Kerbal Space Program. June 24th, 1962. NASA has accepted two new applicants into the space program, namely Neil and Michael Kerman, both exceptional test pilots and aerospace engineers. Their first flight for the Astro Foundation will be aboard Gemini 2. Early in the morning, they ingress their spacecraft and ready systems for flight. When the time is right, Gemini 2 is go for liftoff. seconds before first stage separation, the Chiton 2's engines fail, building up pressure and shutting down. 
For a moment, the abort light flashes inside of the capsule. But before Neil or Michael even have time to react, the second stage engine bursts to life and the abort light extinguishes. The second stage appears to behave as expected, and the fuel lost from the premature shutdown of stage one should be insignificant. So, flight directs that Gemini 2 is still go for orbit. Neil and Michael separate from the rocket and drift freely in orbit of the Earth. Ground teams update the OBC with parameters for maneuvers later in the mission, as Gemini 2 has reached its intended initial orbit. The two Kerbinauts swing the spacecraft towards retrograde and observe the second stage drift away as Florida slips beyond the horizon. The first maneuver of their flight will be to raise their perigee above 200 kilometers. This is easily done with four facing thrusters just before sundown on the first orbit. They will likely remain in this orbit for three days, performing various tasks in the microgravity environment they find themselves in. The first of these tasks is power tool evaluation, determining the feasibility of performing maintenance or experiments in a pressurized suit while weightless. This will most definitely be an important study for future missions in space, the complications of which will no doubt rise significantly. The second task is UHF-VHF polarization, obtaining information on communication systems operating through Earth's ionosphere. The third, a bit more scientific, is studying the synergistic effects of zero gravity and solar radiation on white blood cells. Basically, the biological effects of radiation are largely unknown, and theories exist that weightlessness interacts with radiation in unpredictable ways. Gemini serves as a fantastic platform to uncover these answers to many questions regarding this. Currently, Gemini 2 is in an orbit safely underneath the Van Allen radiation belt around the Earth. But after three days in orbit, Neil and Michael perform a maneuver to raise their orbit just dipping into the belt at Apogee. Doing this is risky as it will no doubt subject the Kerbinauts to radiation. Sensors on early satellites indicate staying there for long is likely not a good idea, but the new chosen orbit should ensure Gemini 2 spends as little time as possible in the belt while still collecting that valuable data. Like clockwork, on day four, the CO2 scrubbers begin to experience buildup and the capsule circulation is reset. The mission has now completed all objectives. Now Neil and Michael will use most of their remaining fuel to once again lower their orbit and prepare for re-entry. The remaining battery power will allow them to stay in orbit for one more day while waiting for the Earth to rotate, planning to splash down in the Gulf of Mexico this time. Fuel cells are currently in development, but not quite ready, and that will allow Gemini 3 and onwards to stay in orbit for up to two weeks or maybe even more. This will be a significant improvement to the capability of the spacecraft and the whole program. But for now, with all major objectives complete, it's Neil and Michael's turn to perform a spacewalk, just to get their space legs as well. Their fun in space coming to an end, Neil and Michael prepare for re-entry. It's time to come home. Neil and Michael experiment further with adjusting their course upon re-entry. Calculations are much closer than Gemini 1's flight, and as the parachutes deploy, personnel at Brownsville facility obtain visual of the spacecraft. Unfortunately, the crew still ended up just shy of the Gulf, and instead land in a farmer's field south of Rio Bravo. A short drive is all that's needed to retrieve the Foundation Kerbinauts from Mexico once again, and the mission is successful. A successful Gemini mission means that we have more money and more science. First of all, our uh, R&D upgrade has finally completed, so we have a R&D speed of 0.915 per day, and we have 10 points available to us. 
Uh, this was just from the science gain of the mission. Now, what do I want to do with that? I think we'll do an even split where I put just a few points into R&D here and then a few points into our rate to VAB. Sorry, R&D I meant to say over here. And we'll close that. As for contracts, we've got a few that are really quite juicy. Orbital flight with maneuvers and two crew. This is going to be able to be performed by Gemini 4. Gemini 3 has a far more fun uh mission plan for it that won't involve this kind of thing so we're gonna accept this contract gives us enough time to complete it lunar rover uncrewed is a new one that's unlocked i'm not sure uh, what unlocked it maybe a different tech node that we got uh, but has a duration of over a year so we'll be able to do this one by that contract and it involves by that deadline and it involves sending a rover to the surface and going to three different sites and i think this is going to be on the dark side of the moon if i remember it correctly so we'll need to maybe launch a few more lunar satellites just to make sure that we can have connection wherever it wants me to go i think we'll be able to do this so we're gonna hit accept on that then the last one here orbital flight with at least three crew this is very lucrative however gemini is of course not able to do this this. but we are able to do this if well we dock to Gemini together within two days of them getting to orbit but I don't think that's gonna happen instead I believe dinosaur is able to do this it's a one crew uh, aircraft glider but there is a crew compartment that's able to be slotted in for two more seats giving it the capacity of three crew Unfortunately, I don't know how fast we'll actually be able to get Dinosaur Orbital, uh, and I'm not 100% certain we'll be able to meet this deadline, although I think we will definitely have a flight of Dinosaur before this deadline, but I don't know if I want to stick three crew on a vehicle before it's gone through orbital testing, for instance. So we're not going to accept this yet, but we will accept it soon. These three contracts aren't really that lucrative, but Wallops can do those on the, in the background. It looks like we've also unlocked Venus Rover. That's interesting. This I am 100% not confident in doing. I don't think that we'll be able to do this contract because that's going to involve probably getting into orbit here first so that we can really pinpoint where the rover is going to land. Rather than it being an interplanetary trajectory, I just quite don't have the confidence in being able to land on a specific place on a planet leaving from Earth on a one-way trip. You know, I'd rather get to orbit first, and that's going to involve more fuel and more weight, so we're not doing that quite yet. Over in the R&D center, I want to research this node here, simply to have the A12 Archangel. Uh, we might call it something different, we might just stick with that, or go K-12 Archangel, maybe. Uh, it's not going to be all that lucrative, but just having that aircraft is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and this series is about having fun, so I'm going to take 35 of the science we gained from that mission and put this in the queue. That's going to take like no time at all to research. I'm not sure where it's going to be in the queue. Uh, we might throw it somewhere else. Alright, it took a while, but I've come to a conclusion of what we're researching here. So. Up in the top here, we've got the Apollo capsule, our lunar lander, and our F1 and the AJ-10. These are going to be uh, just monumental tech nodes to grab. They're stuck behind this blue sky node, so we're going to grab this blue sky node. We're also going to focus our attention down here to interplanetary things like improved communications and making sure our avionics are lighter and less power hungry, and of course more science experiments which helps us abroad. And actually, this is going to be the first node that we're going to pick because these will help us around the Earth, around the Moon. They don't necessarily have to be sent to other planets, but they most definitely will be. Now, upgrading our avionics and our communications, this will most help our interplanetary probes that we send outside of the inner planets, like to Jupiter or beyond. And those planets are so far, they're going to take years to get to. So I'm not going to focus my attention on that quite yet, even though I want to. I really want to, but it's just not going to get us the science and money from those contracts uh, fast enough. Basically, it'll take years for that fine that mission to finally reach it. And I think by the time it does, we'll be trying to land on the moon already. So it's better to focus our attention up here. So we're going to grab for 80 science 
this node, the Lunar Exploration Era Materials Science. Now that gives us access to a whole bunch of things, even like, look at this, the first nuclear engines. They're terrible, they weigh so much. Um, but yeah, that's what we're doing. And we have 82.9 science left, which makes me kind of want to get this tech node because this isn't just interplanetary stuff. This will be RTGs, better solar panels. The, the avionics do help our launch vehicles and our, our other things as well. Uh, so uh, it's not a bad idea just to grab the other blue sky node down here. Okay, what we're going to do is research 1965 orbital rocketry with our remaining little chunk of science here. This is going to upgrade our Chitin and our Catalyst launch vehicles, and it will lead into grabbing the beautiful F1 engine in the AJ-10 here. Another line we're going to have to go towards is getting the J-2 here as well, which has two upgrades to be Saturn V ready, but I think maybe just the first upgrade will be good enough for us. Down here, I don't think we need to research this blue sky node and get these nice little upgrades until after the first moon landing. I think down here, we're good. Maybe we can grab a few of these nodes if we really find it necessary, but we really need to focus up here from now on, up through the first moon landing, and then we'll sort of even out once again. Back out to the Space Center, on the left, we have a lot of contracts to perform, and on the right, we have a lot of science queued up, basically, for the coming 500 or so days. So I would like to speed up this process, but I would more so like to extra speed up our build speed as well, right? Now our build speed is already a lot faster than it used to be because I made the install for myself wrong. Uh, Beardy isn't dealing with these issues, he put the config in the right spot. But anyways, I still want us to be able to build things even faster. Now, upgrading the VAB is one way to do this. Upgrading this will be three and a half million funds. It's not necessary to do this, but it gives us three build lines instead of two. Uh, so that's honestly really, really worth it for being able to just pump out missions. Uh, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of money right now, maybe half a million at most because we're also pretty soon gonna need to grab a level seven pad, which is another two million funds. That is five and a half million funds right there. Another necessary thing for a legit first landing contract is the astronaut complex being upgraded, which is another three and a half million funds. So right there, that's nine million funds going down the drain, and that's not including funding of the new big rockets that we're going to need, the cost of actually building them, the cost of unlocking all the expensive new parts for them. So all in all, around 11 million funds, maybe 11 to 12 million funds to get our moon missions off the ground. So all of that considered, I don't want to spend too much money, but I still want to spend a bunch of money. So let's spend a bunch of money, but nothing too crazy. We just grabbed 20 points and my plan is to throw five points into our R&D and then 15 points into rate two BAB. Uh, okay, let's throw the remaining four into our rate one just to speed it up a tiny bit more. I'm pretty happy with this speed. I know this one's inefficient, but time is a valuable resource that I'm willing to throw money at, all right? So that's pretty much where we are. At the end of this episode, we're cutting it in a half of a year because Beardy has is being swarmed with uni work right now, okay? He just does not have the time to keep up with the sort of schedule we have barely able to keep up with a half a year. So at least for now, I believe our episodes will be aimed to show half of a year. So this is the first half of 1962. We have very fun things coming up in 1962 part two. Uh, we're not gonna do part one and part two, it'll be just the next episode, but there's some really exciting things happening. I can't wait to get to it. But until that happens, thank you so much for watching and peace out.